You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Try to spice it. Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me once again, I have the host of the Postmodern Art Podcast, Nathan Raglan. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for bringing me back. More than anything else, I had a fun time last time when we were talking about Ai Weiwei, and so I'm just, you know, I'm hungry to see what else you got, you're going to bring to the table. <laughs> I see what you did there. And mm-hmm. I, um, speaking of that Ai Weiwei episode, you know, that was voted a fan favorite. I am glad that you are willing to come back because clearly you're bringing the energy, bringing the enthusiasm. Um, I <laughs> I feel like I was saying before, I I probably shouldn't be having you on here because you're the host of the other podcast that (laughs) is willing to look at art in all of its forms. I mean, postmodern art podcast. I was just listening to your episode where you had a guest talking about nail art. You know, I mean, I, I always was priding myself on like, I'm like one of the only podcasts out there that's looking at art history and looking beyond the standard, you know, paintings and sculptures. And then I listen to yours and it's like, yep, you're covering all, all that (laughs) art forms that, uh, that so many other people are missing. So I guess if you are enjoying this show, check out postmodern art podcast because, you know, Nathan's doing good work. Talking to all sorts of different, and I mean all sorts of different artists. Oh, absolutely. I, I do want to say real quickly, thank you for the kind words. Those are wonderful. I mean, I'm a kind of person to where, like, you could probably agree with me whenever I say that, you know, art is a way for people to express themselves. And whatever medium they use to express themselves should definitely be considered art in one aspect for another. So, I mean, and, and you say, you know, the competition, but let's be honest. We're both doing our job promoting <laughs> artists and promoting incredible artwork. Why would we consider that competition? We need to be working together to create the ultimate platform. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, you know, I say that jokingly because oh, I, you I are like, <laughs> the nicest person that I am happy to happy to have on and you know talk up your podcast because I like I said I've been listening I was listening to your last episode I've listened to a number of your episodes about all sorts of different artists illustrators um, nail artists like I said animators all sorts of different stuff that is happening in the wide range of arts that we we can all see appreciate and enjoy so um, I appreciate that you are, as you say, giving giving the artists the platform you feel they deserve, right? Well, once again, thank you for the kind words. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I I also think got to say, just on a side note, I think it is brilliant what you are doing with your merch shop, having all of those different artists create some cool looking designs for you. Um, oh, you all so. know how happy I am that you say that because I've been trying so hard to push out that merch more than anything else. Because uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, like I'm just, I also just want to push out like cool designs and stuff that I think that like an average person should be able to rep. And this is the same kind of stuff. I'm not just pushing this stuff out there just to push it. I buy this stuff. I'm wearing this stuff. Okay. <laughs> I I think you got some cool stuff. Um, and so I will in in addition to including the link to your show and your your site, I'll you know. I'll include the link to your your merch shop in the show notes too. But we should talk about some other artists and some other cool cool designs because we are here to talk a little bit of I guess contemporary art history and we're looking at um Andrew Fuller, a name that may not resonate with with people right off the bat just hearing it cuz like Andrew Fuller sounds like a pretty common name but he is not a common guy. Um, Far from it. You you would if if you don't know him by name, you probably know the description when you hear the green haired, green bearded man with the always delightful, unique glasses on Netflix's popular show, Is It Cake? Have you seen the show? I have seen a good couple of episodes of the show. I know I was a, a, a fan of the whole entire trend of is it cake in the first place yeah. when, it, when it was like on social media or whatnot. And seeing Netflix capitalize on it, making it a show, seeing a couple of episodes of that stuff, Mikey Day with his good energy about and everything or whatnot, the 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 cake bakers or whatnot coming in and like just wowing me more than anything else. Like it's a cool, interesting concept to see really come to life. It is a cool, um, cool concept. I... 
honestly, I'm not that big on social media. Like I have, I have two children. I don't really have the time to dedicate to following all the latest trends. Um, you know, I I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was, and now what's it seems weird and scary to me because I <laughs> am a middle aged man. But <laughs> my daughter, my four year old, was obsessed with is it cake, yes. um, and specifically, specifically Andrew's cakes. So this is one that I have become very familiar with because Mm -hmm. it was a daily routine in my house for a good month where I would sit down and have to watch repeats of of the final baking competition. I should say, you know, for anyone who's listening, if you have not seen the show, Is It Cake? Netflix pays me nothing, but, you know, it's a it's worth a watch. It's a delight. And this episode is going to contain some spoilers, so if you're planning to watch it and haven't seen it yet, you may want to stop right now until you've binged and then come back and enjoy our description of the cakes. I would say even then, like, even with that spoiler warning, like, even if you're listening to this episode, like, I'd still say go back and watch it because not just with Andrew's cakes or whatnot, but the other competitors that compete or whatnot, they pull out all the stops with some of their stuff. Like, it's worth a watch, not just for Andrew alone. Oh, it's incredible. It's it's absolutely amazing what they can do in a medium a lot of people don't think of as a sculpture medium, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So Andrew Fuller, um, you know, he's I've I've read conflicting things online. He, there's not a ton of great biographical information for him, and I guess he has better things to do than respond to my random unsolicited Instagram messages, but (laughs) he's time for a real quick correction here. The first draft of this podcast episode, I had said, I only found one source for Andrew's birthday and of course it was wrong. Um, Andrew was nice enough to reach out to me. I had reached out to him prior to the recording, but he didn't see the messages and, um, he was able to correct the record. And so I do want to get it right and say, Andrew is 43 years old at the time of this recording. He was born October 26th, 1979. Like everyone else, I do of course hate to admit a mistake, but, I also would hate to prematurely age such a wonderful young man. So sincere apologies, Andrew. I appreciate that you have good humor about this, but I wanted to make sure I set the record straight. I only got one source on that, and I always feel uncomfortable when I don't have confirmation on something. So giant asterisks with it. But um, (laughs) apparently, like, he was born in San Antonio, but considers (laughs) himself to be an Iowa native. I mean, um, Des Moines, Iowa is where he calls home these days, where he's set up his baking shop, where he lives with his husband and all of that stuff. In In his youth, when he was a young kid, I guess his father passed away. And... This was, I think, a, I mean, how could that not be a monumental and life altering event in one's, you know, I mean, that's certainly uh, going to have an impact. Um, But aside from the obvious emotional difficulty, the loss, part of what happened there was he went to live with his, they stayed with his grandmother for some time. And his grandma taught him how to cook and how to bake, you know, making, you know, pancakes, griddle cakes, all that sort of stuff. And he describes how baking, cooking, like that was just like his happy space. And I think that's true for a lot of people. I think a lot of people find that artistic, whether it's painting or sculpting or baking or, you know, some people do like woodworking and construction stuff. Like there's something about the process of physically constructing stuff that can be almost meditative. And for a lot of people, that is their their happy place. It is it is what brings them the calm. It is what helps them to focus and, you know, just 
be a better, happier, healthy human. I mean, absolutely. And and so he's he's learning that he's he's doing that as a child. Like I said, learning it from his grandma. He was always an artistic person, always very creatively inclined. Um, he was the kind of guy that just you know, was always making something in lots of different media from what I gather. But he also describes himself as an oddly creative person. I mean, most creative types kind of march to the beat of their own drums, but he would be like in step to a theremin, you know? He was like loving the Tim Burton, goth kind of macabre, spooky stuff. Um, He says not necessarily like the gory, like he liked like, the Hitchcock psycho type of stuff where, you know, there's the implied spooky, scary stuff, but it's not like, it's not that over the top gross stuff that we kind of see today. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say like going back to the point real quick when you were saying that, you know, stepping to the, not really stepping to the beat of his own job. Have you, for those that have not seen a photo of him like before now or whatnot, or seen a look of him, <laughs> you could certainly see that more than anything else with the way that he kind of presents himself more than anything else. And I mean, even going in depth with like the horror and spooky stuff, I remember when watching episodes of Is It Cake, like some of the designs he'd have with like his glasses or whatnot, I'm sure they had like a touch of like the, the horror aesthetic to it. Yeah. And I mean, his glasses, that, that eye popping, eye catching style that has become his signature. I mean, People stop him for for photos all the time these days because he he has gained so much notoriety. But even before that, he would catch your eye just in the way that he he dresses with the bright shock of green hair. And he you know, he's got so many pairs. Like I, I don't think I ever saw him in the same glasses twice. No, like so many not. unique <laughs> glasses. And I think um, it at the Sugar Freak Show um, bakery performance baking sculpting studio that he's opening, um, I believe he's got like a display of all of those glasses and stuff like that because that is part of his his style. I would I would argue it's part of his art is the creative way that he dresses himself and presents himself. I mean, he. In some ways, he feels like he just walked out of like Beetlejuice or something. That is a very good point, considering obviously the influences that he has, like the Tim Burton style or whatnot. Except the fact that you know Beetlejuice is a Tim Burton thing, that completely, utterly makes sense that he looks like he stepped straight from that underworld. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really like that he is out there as himself. Um, you know, green hair and all, visible on display for all to see, and. You know, he's accepted and embraced by the community and because it takes all kinds to have a healthy and happy and thriving community. And I I love that. Um, you can't help but love it, especially with how confident he is pushing himself out there like that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as I'm as I'm getting back a little bit to sort of biography, he started baking as a kid, learning it the traditional way, grandma teaching him and all of that stuff. And he said in an interview, he found that he's creating other forms of art. People look at it, they like it, they appreciate it, but, you know, they don't always buy it. But with food, it's like it's this categorical shift. All of a sudden you make something edible and people are like, well, you got to eat and you might as well enjoy it so that they'll like justify the expense. You know what I mean? I mean, I've seen obviously both ends of the spectrum when it comes to that kind of stuff, because I, you know, I've talked to a bunch of artists or whatnot. And as incredible as some of the stuff out there, sometimes it's hard for them to sell stuff to people. It's hard for them for people to really buy it. But obviously, when it comes to food more than anything else, like especially if you've seen like the best example, of that would be edible arrangements more than anything else. If you think about <laughs> an edible arrangement, it's technically a piece of art more than anything else. But people are going to buy it more than anything else because it's a nice, beautiful aesthetic that people can enjoy and have their bellies full of. Well, yeah, and I, I think there's some truth to that. And I think there's also something about, you know, food, it gets at something primal. We all bond, like it's so social. We all can come together around food and make connections around food. You know, you take people from all different backgrounds, you know, put them in a room. What's the first thing that they can find some commonality about is food. You know, yeah. I, I'm reminded of like the David Sedaris story where he's talking about taking um, 
he's taking French classes to try to learn to speak speak the language and and you know he's mixed in with a bunch of people who are struggling so much to to speak the language and you know someone asks about a holiday like um Easter or something and instead of describing the religious tradition and all of that complexity they immediately start talking about just food what do you eat there's the you know the, you get the chocolates and all of that sort of <laughs> stuff that it's just like there's something about nourishment that that taps into something primal that we all need and and it creates warm feelings and brings people together and as somebody who has sold some art and been in in various locations where like you're talking to people about a painting and they're like i love it but i don't know if the colors are going to go with my couch or something else like that that it's just like there's always that that reason for for someone to be like i i really like it but whereas when it's food people are like well it doesn't matter if it goes with a couch cuz it's it's going in my belly you know i mean i would certainly hope it doesn't go with the couch i don't want the couch <laughs> to be stained because of the food i get <laughs> um yeah so he starts to apply his artistic skills to making edible artworks. Um, he started his first company just called Guy Needs Cake. <laughs> There's something it's a good I name. Absolutely. I love the directness of it. Um, in in interviews, he's like, yeah, really original and stuff. But honestly, I, I love the directness of it. I love the bluntness of it. Um, starts making cake just like for his husband. And he's... He's watching baking shows and thinking to himself, like, I could do that. And I know we've all had that thought, right? But, like, he he had something behind it. He actually did have the skills to back that up. I mean, it's it's, it's one thing it's one thing to watch a sporting event and be like, oh yeah, I could be out there with those players. I can I can you know defend or whatnot. I can hit that home run or whatnot. It's another thing to actually enact on it more than anything else. And for Andrew, like this is bit like the stuff that he's seeing or whatnot is essentially like the playoffs of cake competitions more than anything else. Yeah, I mean he 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 had the skills to back up the swagger. Like it wasn't mm-hmm. just it wasn't just like a hollow boast from him. Like he apparently actually could make that stuff and so he starts baking things and his family and friends you know that immediate circle start going nuts for it and it grows from there um i think his first bit of sort of viral fame came from a pie that like had a human face in it well not literally a human face but appeared to have a human face in it um his first hyper realistic cake was a birthday cake for um, – the client was a nurse who was studying to become a midwife. And so he makes a what appears to be a photorealistic cake of a placenta. And he brings it into a hospital. And apparently it was so realistic looking. I've, I've seen pictures and videos of this, and it is jaw-droppingly realistic looking. He brings it in, and at the front desk, they start flipping out, saying, like, how dare you bring a biohazard into the lobby? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. I, I'm a fan of cake, but, um, you know, like, especially, like, hyper-realistic ones, you know, seeing the, the, you know, is it cake or whatnot. Like, I love those cakes, but there's just some things that you look at, and you have to wonder, why is it cake? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I think what's what's really delightful is like he he thinks through all of these different things. It's not just like the outer shell looks like something like when you cut into it, it's like a raspberry coulis or something like that. I don't know my I don't know my my cake terminology. I'm just like one step ahead of that host. I'm not going to fall for (laughs) Tiltscape and the other stuff they made up to mess with Mikey Day. But I. (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm not going to pretend that I am an expert in the culinary arts, but I do appreciate the attention to detail that he's using some sort of like a, a viscous fluid, a, a sweet, I think it's called a coolie, but like it just, it oozes out as you slice into it. So it, it's getting not just like the look, but the texture and the experience of cutting into it that, that has 
that visceral response. And while it may not be something that I would enjoy, I I couldn't get past that ick factor. But <laughs> my hat is off to him because, like, you know, it's one thing when you're looking in special lighting and when you're looking for from 20 feet away. But, like, when you walk into a hospital and the medical staff is looking at it and saying, whoa, 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 <laughs> you can't you can't bring biohazards into here. Like, that is some skill that, to that's... fool those people in that context. I mean, again, at the end of the day, like you have to to commend the the time and effort Andrew has put into this stuff to make just about anything look that hyper realistic and convincible to where, again, like you said, professionals in the field that should recognize that stuff instantly think it's the thing they need to recognize instantly. (laughs) Yeah. And and I think I think a lot of that comes back to him finding baking and the culinary arts as his his sort of happy escape that, you know, the way that you get into that flow state and you just get lost in the creative process and you find the satisfaction in striving for accuracy and revising and revising and revising. That's how you make these these wonderful things that I never even knew there was a market for, but he's found it and, and again, happy for him with that. Mm-hmm. And so... After after doing some of these hyper realistic things, like I said, social media, he's gone viral. He um, he did the Halloween baking championship in 2018. He was on another show, Candyland, in 2020. But what really catapulted him to the next level was the show, Is It Cake? So after the break. We are going to take a little time to look at and, you know, respond to his winning piece from Is It Cake? Now we're back here talking. um, I've got Nathan Raglan from Postmodern Art Podcast, always up for enjoying art in all of its different forms. And we are talking about Andrew Fuller, the the incredible culinary artist, the baker who won the the hit Netflix show, Is It Cake? I put a few photos of his winning cake design. Do, uh, Do you have the doc? Are you able to see? Oh, I've been having to open this entire time, so I can absolutely see these gorgeous shots. Okay, so as you're looking at it, what's what's jumping out to you? about this work well two things are jumping out to me more than anything else one the clothes that are like sitting on top or whatnot i i didn't again keep on i did not watch the finale or whatnot are those actually part of it or are those just like a, a, a sort of clothes they just on top, on top okay that's that is part of it and that is edible that just is like edible everything else then that, that is that's edible the, that is the first thing I want to commend more than anything else. Cause the fact that I had the question, like that has to be like a prop. They just add on top more than anything else. No, that's actually edible. Okay. Yes. That's good. Having like the, the shadows and like the fabric, you know, texture more than anything else. It, 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 it's a good touch more than anything else. Secondly, like just looking at all the different textures and all the different like patterns or whatnot with some of the, the different aspects of it. Uh, like for obviously for those that, are listening instead of actually seeing the piece or whatnot. It's a suitcase more than anything else. Uh, a giant suitcase, leather suitcase or whatnot, clothes on top of it, stickers on the side of it or whatnot. Like it's absolutely stunning, especially like the texture of what's supposed to be like the leather on the suitcase itself. Like goodness. Like I, I it looks like something I could just grab and take to wherever in the world I want to go. Yeah. And if you are um, if you are listening on a platform like Spotify, um, Amazon Music or any of those other platforms that support episode specific cover art, you can see the image of the cake. Um, You don't just have to rely on our description. Um, But yeah, he's got this cake that well, I guess it's really multiple cakes because he he baked um, two different cakes complicated stuff that is like you know beyond me i don't know i i look at cakes and i'm like chocolate or vanilla and he's got like it's <laughs> a pistachio with a rose buttercream and like all this other stuff um but he he baked two different cakes in this and covered it in like modeling chocolate and he's got um 
it looks like a brown leather suitcase and we see these straps i mean you can see it appears to you it appears to have like the thread work there and you can see like broken threads and all of those little details um pressing in tools to get the texture and then rubbing um pigments into the little creases to create that look of real aged leather i mm -hmm. i love the way that he's capturing all of these details um the not just the textures and the colors you know he's he's got the imperfections and that's where you get that's where you get realism is when you've got those imperfections it's not stickers slapped onto the suitcase this it looks like the stickers were slapped on years ago and they're tearing and they're discolored and we see parts of it peeled off you know what yeah. i mean like that's my experience with putting stickers on stuff the only thing that i look at with this and i start to think like i i would not if i were glancing at it think that that is anything but a suitcase but in the context of like looking at this critically it's almost like there's too much happening with the wear and tear you know what i, I mean i can see that with some parts i can see you know like how it could seem like a busy you know piece more than anything else with some of the imperfections seeing just how like some of the creases are how some of the stickers like it looks like every single sticker that's been slapped on here were slapped on like years ago more than anything else with how some of the tears and some of the like the the i guess the schmear or whatnot or whatnot uh being over some of these stickers or whatnot it's easy to to see how busy of a piece that this can be and make you think like it like for me personally like if i was to glance at it like it'd be a busy piece for me but i'd also be thinking like jesus where is this person gone like what did they do take this and like toss it down a hill or something like that or <laughs> well i think that's where that's where when i start to think about it it feels like too much um i still impressed still way more than i can do and i i i think we have that idea that the authenticity comes from the wear and tear, the imperfections, and all of those things that happen to something over time. But as I look at this, and I, I would think like, okay, what is the story of this piece? Who is the right. owner of this suitcase? As I'm looking at it, I, I just think stuff that I have that I beat up, I kind of beat up and then I throw away. Mm. This is like, it has been beaten up and held on to. And the stuff that's meaningful to me, I don't let it get so beat up. I'm more careful with it. So the stuff right. that I hold on to for years and years and years, yes, it has some wear and tear, but not that much wear and tear. And the stuff that gets really, you know, knocked down and thrown around tends to be the stuff that I'm like, yeah, I'm done with this. I mean, to and I be replace fair. it. I mean, to be fair, I mean, obviously you and Andrew are two different people. It could be because Andrew's a lot more sentimental with this, especially with some of the stickers slapped on it. It could be because, you know, for the longest time, Andrew didn't have enough money to get a brand new suitcase that would be worthwhile. This one's been reliable. So, like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it more than anything else. Like, the story could always be different. And everyone's values, that's where I was looking for. Everyone's yeah. values are a little bit different when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, for Andrew, like, you know, yeah, he could be holding on to the same raggedy suitcase for years on end. I mean, that, that just it's it's how he's wired differently yeah i i see that i see that i i'm just looking at it and and again this is just because i need to fill out almost half an hour on the podcast and <laughs> i'm struggling to find a way to to nitpick and complain about this piece but like the only the only note that i could think of because i don't understand how to construct well i don't understand how to construct a cake like just a flat cake um but then like <laughs> and i've seen it done i've seen it done many times i've <laughs> attempted it i've failed at it but like to build up those layers and then like i know that he wrapped it in like modeling chocolate and then i i i watched it play out and still don't understand how it was done but as i'm looking at this and tr struggling to find a way to criticize it and offer some sort of insight beyond just like 
It's really good. Um, I mean, I, I, I think what I, because this is the teacher in me, I, I always want to find something that I can, can tell the one student who's going to listen to my podcast <laughs> when you're trying to make something look authentic and, and realistic and this can be true in all sorts of contexts. I mean, this can be true of, you know, your painting of flowers in a vase or whatever. You want to have some imperfections. You want to have some evidence of where. You want to have, um, to take the still life of flowers example, you want to have some evidence that, you know, those those flowers were cut and put into a vase. So, really they're going to start to wilt slowly and gravity is acting upon them. So maybe you want to have maybe a couple petals missing. Maybe you want to have a couple like that are starting to droop the just the slightest bit. You know, it doesn't all need to be like everything in the vase is dying, but there should be evidence of the fact that they're not in their prime and, and you know, there are other forces acting upon them. And there is some some wear and tear to things that are in the real world. The real world is wonky. And when I'm constructing to to torture that metaphor, but you know, painting background, when I'm constructing a still life, I don't I don't put every kind of defect that I can think of or might observe into the painting or drawing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to have flower petals falling off and it's drooping because of the gravity and it's starting to get discolored. And, you know, like you're not going to do all of those things because it just it feels like too much. You know, you want some evidence of forces acting upon it, but like too, you go too far the other way and it's just as cartoonish as if it were perfect. Right. Or that's the danger that you run into. I mean, that's that's fair enough. I was thinking, like, with this, like, the one complaint, if I was to complain about one thing for me personally looking at this piece, it would have to be the stickers, mainly the ones on the back. Because I don't know about you, but whenever I do get stickers, I like to have a variety of stickers. And, like, he's got, like, pairs of two of, like, two of the same Japan ones, two of the same Italian ones, two of the same Canadian ones, and I'm like, if it was me, I would, like, if I was to visit that same place, I wouldn't get the same exact sticker to slap on the suitcase. I'd like to have a little bit of a variety to it. That, but that's just me personally. That is my preference. So. Okay, so I, I get where you're coming from on that, but what I was thinking with the the two of those on there, um, and maybe this is just my natural propensity to try to build a narrative about stuff. I was seeing, you know, two copies of the same stickers on there because I'm imagining that these are stickers referencing his travels with his husband. And so I'm imagining um. it's it's the two of them together going to those places and and that becomes a a, a signifier of of them seeing the world together that there's two of them in one, you know, because when, when you marry your partner, it's two people becoming one. Um, or you could say it is two people no longer living as individuals and be odd like me and give people a condolence card for their wedding saying, <laughs> so sorry for the loss of your fiance. <laughs> 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 i mean to be fair yeah i didn't even make that connection with that narrative but that would make so much sense is it would also make more sense why there's only like a singular paris sticker compared to all the other ones and why that one looks in my opinion a little bit more beat up for the than the other ones that could be like his first trip right there to paris and like that's the sticker he slaps onto there and then everything afterwards either he met his husband in paris or just after after you know meeting with his husband and marrying him like the travels that they had to go is why there's the two stick. That makes more sense now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I, I, like I said, I, I have not been in touch with him and I cannot confirm that, but that's, that's my read on it. Um, just because I do know that when you're constructing stuff and you're trying to be so realistic, nothing happens accidentally, right. you know? And I, I, I have to assume there's symbolism with the repetition of the, 
with the repetition of the stickers and that's the that's the symbolism that seemed to make most sense to me um on my shallow reading of it and i'm wrapping it up I want just a three point rating scale and where should this hang the loo is this something to look at the lab. the lab is this something to learn from or the loop british for the bathroom yeah there's a the poop joke in there somewhere yeah. oh that's terrible i think okay it's gonna be interesting what i'm gonna say for this one because i like to be a little creative with this answer i think like it could that? go in i think it could go with all three but only if it's for the celebration of something and people are eating that cake because like andrew said Food is meant to be eaten. Art is meant to be enjoyed or whatnot. So having them in any one of these locations as part of a celebration for the art that is there more than anything else, as long as the cake is consumed, as gorgeous as it is, it's not intended to last forever. It's not supposed to last forever more than anything else. So having it there as a celebration for everyone to enjoy and enjoy some good cake at the end of the day, that's why I think it could go in any three of those places, but not forever. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair enough. Um I I kind of had had similar thoughts. I ultimately ended up uh, saying this one goes into the loo, and okay. I I said that not okay. So when I first started doing this, I was I was thinking like it would just be the 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 loo of the lab and the loo. It's it's alliteration and it's it's funny to talk about something that you know should just it's a waste. We need to get rid of it. Um, <laughs> But then it's like, well, my show, my my brand isn't really to be spiteful and putting things down. So, so that that made it not work quite so well. Um, but ultimately, I think there is something about, as you said, art that is meant to be consumed and is not meant to be permanent. And I don't say it. I don't anymore say it's for the loo as a way of dismissing it that it started that whole thing started because my college roommate used to re- refer to like his failed paintings as a bathroom piece he would say that's where <laughs> art goes to die <laughs> and so it just stuck in my head but i i think it's legitimate to say that that art can be good and also not need to be permanent right and i i think it's worth understanding that like it would be unsettling if a cake could be preserved and still be okay years later. Isn't there, isn't there a museum somewhere that does have like cake from like Victorian England or whatnot, but they have to like pump it with so, like so many different like chemicals and stuff to where it's not cake anymore at this point. Oh, I hope not. There probably is. I just think of my first car where one of my bandmates dropped a McGriddle in there and I didn't find it until I was going to sell the car two Ooh. years after that band broke up and it looked the same. Oh, that's, And it was oh, the no. most unnerving thing I have ever seen. But, but his cakes are not like that. His cakes are meant to be enjoyed and his cakes are, um, he, he talks about how they're not just to look at, like, you know how some stuff it it's decorated so much uh, when you're watching these baking shows it's like oh we're sculpting 90 percent of this of um you know rice krispie treats or or what did they say like cereal treats because they don't want to do the buzz marketing but they're they're talking about like how they're they're making it out of just massive amounts of fondant and um rice krispies and other stuff that like it just doesn't look like it would taste good but he out of principle wants it to not only look good but also taste good and i feel like that is a part of the art is the full sensory experience and you can't get that if it's in a glass case on display only to look at it needs to be something that is sort of I don't know. I don't want to get too like existentialist and like, you know, it you need to be in the moment and the sensory experience. But like I think that's true of especially culinary arts. Like it needs to be something that you can look at and feast on with your eyes and then 
taste and smell and like it's that immersive experience yeah i mean when it comes to you know especially like the cake competitions that you're talking about like it's one thing to look at something that looks absolutely gorgeous and then ask the question is it really cake is it cake because of all the different stuff that they add to it but to have like the full experience like andrew is trying to do with these cakes not only having it look good but i bet if we were to have a slice of it right now tastes absolutely amazing that makes it a full experience whatever you wanted to find an art going experience yeah, I mean, he's balancing all of those competing interests because, you know, a lot of times to make something look good, it's hard to also have it taste good. He strikes that balance in ways that, like, I have seen him do it. I've watched him do it. I've watched the videos so many times, thanks mm. to my daughter, <laughs> and still I have no idea how any of it works. I, I end up just assuming he's magic. I mean, who's to say he's not magic? It, it seems more plausible than that an actual human being can just use a KitchenAid mixer and put these ingredients together and come out with something like that. I mean, just like any artist, like, you know, he's taken the, the time and effort to really perfect the craft that, you know, us common folks can only look at and be like, how? How? <laughs> and I, I do love that, uh, you know, since his fame, he's he's staying in his hometown in Des Moines uh, and opening a studio that's open to the public, the Sugar Freak Studio, where he does live uh, live sculpting, baking sessions where like people can see that process unfold while they enjoy, I'm sure, delicious cake pops and other stuff that <laughs> he's got there. But he gives us that peek behind the curtain, which I think is really, really cool. Um, and I think that's that's probably a good note to end on. So I'm just going to once again say thank you so much. I And I, I really got to got to say I love the podcast, Postmodern Art Podcast, and I appreciate that you are just a genuinely nice guy taking time to talk to me on a Saturday afternoon when I – when I send you a message saying, hey, I need to record in two days and I am I will surprise you with the topic. And <laughs> you're like, sounds good. Um, I mean, so I, I said, thank you. I, I said it before with the last one. I had a fun time with the last episode. I know your podcast is a good quality podcast that everyone should take a listen to, whether this is your first episode or your hundredth episode or whatnot. Like you you put in the time and effort you put in a good quality podcast and i was more than happy to be immersed in whatever artist you were gonna throw in my direction i'm just glad it was another food-based one because the last one was sunflower seeds so <laughs> <laughs> i did not even think of that connection. oh this, uh, so, is so why what, I, this is why i love having another arts guy on there you bring the different connections there you go so what's the next one gonna be the oscar meyer wienermobile or something like that like what, what, what food based one are you gonna drag me in next <laughs> you'll just have to wait and find out but thank you very much once again nathan from postmodern art podcast thank you once again kyle this concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.